Just a short video today folks, I want to show you, remember some time ago I talked about these ferrite cores that I got from Hobby King and I spoke about how they're often used on ESCs to reduce the amount of noise that comes down the power line. Well, on my little blackout mini quad I was having a bit of trouble with black lines coming across the video signal when I was uh, running a lot of power under, under full throttle and when the battery started to get down a bit, these little black lines would get worse and worse and worse and it's basically it was caused by noise coming into the camera on the power supply line. Now the camera is a 12 volt camera so it's effectively connected, was effectively connected straight to the battery so when the battery got a little bit soft that means its internal resistance goes up a bit as it gets discharged and when it was under heavy load you'd get these black lines that really just well, ruined the FPV experience. So what I did was I took one of these ferrite cores and I wound a whole lot of single strand copper wire and they can use stranded copper wire but I wanted to get as many turns on here as I could to get maximum inductance, that's a maximum filtering effect. So I used uh, solid copper wire, enameled copper wire, and I ended up getting making up a toroid like that. When I measured it, it was 400 microhenries, which is quite a bit of inductance really. And what that does is that it filters the noise out before it gets to the camera. So this coil connects to the 12 volt feed where the camera used to go. And I've also put a capacitor in here. There's an electrolytic capacitor down here, uh, 470 microfarads. And what that does is it also helps suppress the, uh, the noise pulses that are coming down from the power feed. So now, since I've made this modification, the video is crystal clear. I'm really happy with the result. So, Okay, to make your own toroidal filter, you're going to need a toroid. Yes, that's the Hobby King one. Some enameled copper wire. And the reason I use enameled copper wire instead of the plastic insulated multi-strand wire is because You've seen already that these toroids, you can't get many turns of plastic insulated wire or silicon insulated wire through them. And to get the best filtering effect, we want as much, or as many turns on this toroid as possible to create the maximum magnetic field, which gives us the maximum inertia to the change in current. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to peel off about a metre of this copper wire. Don't ask me what thickness it is, I haven't measured it, but um, I'll, actually I'll put it on the bottom of this video because I'll measure it afterwards. But about a metre is what I'll use here. Sorry, I banged the camera. Um, it's probably more than I need because we're probably not going to be able to fit a whole meter onto that core. But it's better to have too much than too little. Here we go, chop that off. So here's my about a meter of, well maybe a little bit more than a meter of wire. I shall, um, now I shall simply make the toroid by passing this wire through here and then running it round and round and round like this. Now it's quite important if you want to get the maximum number of turns on that you Make sure that the wire is pressed firmly against the sides. Don't just sort of pull it through and expect it to sit nice. You'll actually have to sort of follow it with your hand. I'll try and get this one lined up. So you want to press it so that it's hard against that ferrite, not sort of poking out in a big half circle there. And you just keep doing this until you've got as many turns on there as possible. Now it's important you don't go back over old turns. So the next turn should be, you know, completely parallel to that one, not sort of looped over the back of it or anything. You want to keep it all as nice and neat as possible because neatness means you'll get the maximum number of turns on there. I'm not going to make you sit through the boring few minutes while I wire this one up, so I'll use a bit of camera trickery. There we go, done. Um, it's not the neatest one I've ever made, but it gives you an idea of what yours should look like. It doesn't matter that the windings aren't perfectly spaced, just so long as you don't have sort of big clumps of windings. And I've just twisted the two wires together here so they don't unravel. But there you go. I did have some wire left over, so it was less than a meter I could fit on there. And now we'll put this on the uh, instrumentation and just see how much inductance it has. Now this, for those who are interested, is a cheap um, capacitance and inductance meter. You can get these from a number of Chinese sources. Sometimes they come in a box, but I got this real cheap without a box. And if I turn it on, it says LC meter. And uh, over range because it's not connected. So I will connect it up. And I've scraped the enamel off the ends of their wire here so we get a proper electrical, electrical connection. And we'll see how many microhenries this is. Well, there we go, that's pretty close to the last one. 383.6 microhenries. That's the inductance of our toroidal core. And that's, that's pretty good. That's going to do a good job when we, conduct, when we use that in conjunction with a capacitor. So why don't we do some measurements, see what this, how this works. Maybe we'll throw it on the scope and you can have a look and see the effect that these components are going to have on the type of noise you'll be getting going into your camera on an FPV craft. Okay, here we go. We've got our little cheap Chinese signal generator again. I've used this before. It's producing a square wave and I'll just hook it up. 
here's the oscilloscope, so I'll be watching what's going on, and I'll just create a, I'll just hook this up so you can see what is actually coming out of that little signal generator here. There we go. So it's just a little pulse. It's the kind of pulse you'd get when uh, a magnet was energized or whatever in the motor. So it's the kind of noise you're probably getting on top of your ESC. Now that's just directly connected to the oscilloscope. Now let's put the inductor, that, that uh, toroidal core, in series and see what happens. Now, I'll just, it's a bit dodgy at the moment. It's just le rest, resting on there. I haven't actually got crocodile clips here at the moment. So what I'll do is I'll hook it on and we'll measure the amplitude of that. That's uh, about nearly two divisions. I'll actually adjust the amplitude so it is two divisions. There we go. So i set the position. All these little controls here you can tweak. That's it. So it's virtually two divisions. That's two volts. Those little spikes are two volts high. So now I'm going to run through the inductor and we'll see what that does to that noise. There we go. It's halved the noise. That's going through the inductor and this is going directly without the inductor. So you can see the inductor itself has dropped the size of those spikes down by half because as I say it's got a flywheel effect. It makes it very hard for current to pass through. An inductor will pass direct current but it won't. It doesn't like passing alternating current or changing current. So there we go. That has a 50% reduction in the noise, the spike that's coming down the line there. Uh, we've simulated that would be from our ESC going straight into our video camera. So that's really worthwhile. Now to kill it off completely I've got an electrolytic capacitor here. This is a 470 microfarad capacitor and I'm going to put that across things as well. This should almost completely eliminate the spike and I have to fiddle around here because as I, say, I don't have clip leads I'll have to position things very carefully. Okay I'm ready to drop the capacitor on and there we go. It's completely killed the remaining noise. Now it's just a few little spikes jumping up and down the background there but basically the noise is, is effectively gone. So we've gone from those two volt spikes down to nothing, next to nothing. In fact if I or try and hold this position here so it's going to actually make connection. Fortunately, as I say, this is all just floating in mid-air at the moment, so I'll bend some wire. And try to get them connecting. There we go. I'll turn up the, the scope and oops, come back because it's bumped. There we go. Now quietly without bumping anything, I'll turn this up and we should just probably get noise. There's just general noise. There we go. So there's nothing, there's nothing, no sign of that pulse left in this particular setup, which is quite amazing, really. Of course, in the real world, um, We'd probably get a bit of noise there, but hey, that's pretty damn good. I'm happy with that. That's uh, We've created a filter that's removed all the noise. And here's what the filter looks like down here. As you can see, just uh, doesn't focus very well closer. There we go. So there's our toroid and there's our capacitor. And I've got some resistors in here because they basically just um, are there to provide some load and a series pass resistor, some series resistance in the circuit. But there you go. That's all it took to kill the noise on my mini blackout and you can do the same thing so yeah that's a 470 microfarad capacitor obviously the voltage has to be rated for whatever your voltage is on a three cell pack I think this is a 16 volt um, hang on have a look yeah this is a 16 volt 470 microfarad now there's a thing called ESR which is the effective series resistance this is getting quite technical now but basically the capacitor you use for this should have a low ESR. What that means is it's able to suck up high frequencies. High frequencies, basically, this looks like a short circuit. And this is the difference between a capacitor and an inductor. When you're dealing with changing current, a capacitor will allow changing current to pass through. An inductor will resist the flow of changing current. Direct current can't pass through a capacitor, but it can pass through a coil. That's why we have the coil in series to allow the direct current to pass through into the camera and the capacitor in parallel so that the changing voltage gets short-circuited to ground effectively, taking out all those pulses or what's left of those pulses. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed that and you'll know how to make your own. And uh, sorry I didn't actually do the whiteboard thing, just wasn't really necessary. So here we go, here's our 12 volt camera, a 12 volt FPV camera, board camera. Now, 5 volt cameras aren't usually affected quite so much by this noise because they have a regulator in there which chops that noise off the top. But a lot of board cameras these days are 12 volts, so you run them directly from your 3 cell battery. So if that's the case, here's your 12 volt camera, and here's your battery, we'll do a battery over here, turn plus and minus, and the minus of course just connects like that, and the plus connects like this. So 
what could be simpler? There's the simple circuit. There's our camera connected to our battery. And that all works very, very well until you start throwing other stuff on here. So let's say we have a, down here we've got an ESC, and it's connected up to a motor, driving a propeller or something. Now suddenly things start to go wrong, quite often with FPV, because these motors can draw a lot of current on the little blackout. I've got four of them. So they're going to draw quite a bit of current. And motors, electric motors, don't draw current in a steady stream. They draw it in little bursts. A little, the speed controller pulses, chops up the DC and sends it into the motor in little bursts so it can control the speed. So suddenly you've got a variable load on the 12 volt line here. And normally if we draw a little oscilloscope graph, here's our 12 volt line. I hope we can see that it's still on the board. Oh, yes, just, just up there. Um, 12 volts. That's what it would normally look like. But if we start putting a load on, let's say we put a load of um, I don't know, 30 amps, the voltage will probably drop down to there, which might be 11 volts. Simple enough, isn't it? But what if you've got a, a load that's going up and down like our motors will be? You know, it turns the magnet on, turns the magnet off, turns the magnet on, turns the magnet off. Every time it turns the magnet on, the voltage will drop because there's more load. Every time it turns it off, the voltage will go back up. What we actually end up with is something that looks like this. There we go. That's because the magnets are turning off and on, off and on, off and on, very quickly through the ESC. Now, when that happens, of course, our sudden, suddenly our 12 volts is no longer a steady 12 volts. It will also have this stuff on the top, this horrible noise. And that's what makes the lines in your FPV camera if that noise is too great. So how are you going to stop it? Well, what a lot of people do is actually run their FPV gear from a separate battery. But nah, on a small thing like a, a 250 size multi rug, that's just too much extra weight. You don't want that. You want to keep things light. So what you do is you put in the line there. My whiteboard's been a bit spastic today, but oh, it's working a bit, I suppose. Um, what you do is you need to put a filter in there. And that's where these toroidal cores come in. When you wind one up, it becomes what we call an inductor. And that's the international symbol for an inductor. It's Basically, it looks like a curl of wires. That's it. So that creates an inductor. And what happens with an inductor is it works a bit like, remember I did the PWM conversion to DC We're using a thing called integration. Well, inductors do something very similar. They try and turn a fluctuating waveform into a steady waveform because they're like, a, as I mentioned in the other video, they're like a big flywheel. They take a bit of power to get going, but then if you take the power off, they keep going. So that provides sort of like an inertia to the flow of electricity. Quite simple, really. And it does it through a magnetic field. So if we had a look at a waveform that was like this, which might be a noisy waveform, when you run that through an inductor, obviously the inductor has an effect. The, the voltage isn't going to rise so quickly, so you'll get a bit of a, it'll take a while to rise up, but then it's starting to drop off again, so it'll go down like that. And then when it starts to rise again, it starts to fall. Because this is so slow to change, the magnitude of the fluctuation in voltage and fluctuation in current is significantly reduced. So suddenly, instead of having this big noisy waveform, you've got a much smoother wave, a lower amplitude wave. It reduces the noise, but that's not enough quite often because, you know, a inductor on its own only does part of the work. So what we do is we put a capacitor in here as well. And we know from our video on integration pulse width modulation to DC, capacitors do the same thing as an inductor, basically. They add a bit of, you know, it's like a reservoir of electricity. So now, if we look at this, we use another color because somewhere I have another color. Here it is. Um, the green is the effect of the inductor. Then if we add the capacitor, then we get this as well. That further works to, to slow down the change. So we end up with a waveform that's really quite clean. A lot of the noise has basically been knocked out of it. There'll be a bit left because nothing's perfect. But you'll find that you'll get a massive reduction in the amount of noise going into your 12 volt board camera. That means the picture that comes out will be sparkly clear and free of lines, or much reduced in terms of the amount of lines you may have on it. So this is where those inductors are really, really handy. Now, as I say, on the one I've used for the black, uh, blackout mini quad, I just got some thin enameled copper wire, put as many turns on as I could reasonably fit in there, because more the merrier, and that was my inductor. It worked out to be, when I measured it on the bench, it worked out to be 400 micro henries, and that's the measurement of inductors. You know, resistors are measured in ohms, and um, inductors are measured in henries, or micro henries, because a henry's a really big amount of inductance. So that's what I did, stuck that in there, piece of cake. Now, those toroidal, toroidal cores are quite big because there's one thing you have to watch out for. We are drawing uh, through the camera only 100 milliamps or something like that, 90 to 120 milliamps usually. That's nothing. It's, it's a tenth of an amp. So this coil works really well. But if we tried to draw you know, lots and lots of amps, then the coil wouldn't work very well at all because it would do something called saturating. That means 
Um, with a, if we were to look at the magnetic field of a coil, oh, we're getting into the science of it now. <clears throat> My whiteboard's getting all stroppy, it won't erase properly. Um, if we were getting into magnetic flux, and it's, that's a measure of magnetism, how strong a magnetic field is. So if we look like this, if we say, this is increasing current in amps through our inductor, and this is the magnetic flux, the line is the actual amount of magnetism that's produced, then it goes like this. It levels off. Then no matter how much extra current you put through, you don't get any more magnetic flux. Because it's saturated, the, the, the core is saturated, that toroid can no longer be any magnetized any more than it is. And when that happens, the flywheel effect disappears. So if you draw too much current and you saturate the core, then it effectively seems to have no inductance or very little inductance at all. So it might drop from an apparent 400 microhenries down to 10 microhenries. So you've got to have bigger inductors to handle bigger currents. And the, the toroidal core we've got there is good for an amp or two. So that's fine. It's no problem. I'm happy with that. We'll use the ones from Hobby King. They work really well. So yeah, um, if you use a little tiny ferrite bead or something, it may not work as well because it might saturate. Although in this case, probably unlikely, but those cores are what I had, so it's what I used. That's how I used them. And the results have been quite remarkable, I have to say. It's certainly tidied up the video a lot. So if you've bought some of those toroidal cores, you're wondering what to do with them, and you're getting noise on your video camera, there's something to try.